Welcome to the Ramon Foster Show, starring the one and only Ramon Foster. It brought to you by the Get Go Cafe and Market, where they're open for business, serving hot, fresh food twenty four seven. I feel like I'm all tangled up here, Ramon. <laughs> well, it's like that sometimes, DK. It is Hump Day, man. I, we it said is. It we, here we are. Here we are. It is. There's no question about that. You know who else is here? At least in town. Who? Larry Ogunjobi is here. Hey, hey, hey. Larry hey, O hey. is here. This is a football player. This is yes, a player, is. Moan. Yes, he is, man. Uh, and can we can we get credit or uh, percentage or oh, something? Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> Moan wants a cut because... <laughs> I know, and you, and, and there are people who who did acknowledge that yesterday's episode. <laughs> that was the first name that Moan mentioned that he'd like to see the Steelers get. And what do you know? Larry shows up in town. Hey, everybody, I'm here. Hey. Moan said I'm supposed to be here, and then he signs. <laughs> I gotta reach out to Larry too, man, just because just to welcome him to the city. Uh, and this is the part people don't want to hear. Most of the time, guys communicate with one another too, so it's just. He was always respectful. I know he had that one situation with Mason. Um, but even even after that point, he apologized for it and, and just kind of moved forward with his career. And by the way, last year, 2021, probably had his best statistical career that he's had, aside from the fact that he got injured, man. I thought he was due for a big payday. I've always known him as a guy that you couldn't take a plate off of. He hit me with a couple of moves here and there while I was playing. I was like, okay, guy, I see I got to take you serious. You're at his point, he wasn't a a backup type of guy. He became a guy, a fixture in that uh, Cleveland Browns defense. And you look at him and say he's undersized. No, 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 no. That guy is a football player. And I kind of say that like Coach Tomlin in a sense because that's what he looks for. He don't care what you look like, how you got there. Can you play ball? Do you love football also? So I'm excited to kind of see him here. This is his third stop in the AFC North. And I'll say this. I don't think without a doubt. Had he made it through that season healthy, they would have paid him as opposed to the other guy they paid in Cincinnati. That's how high I think of him. Yeah, that That's the thing. Uh, he had, of course, the Liz Frank injury. Um, yep. Anybody who's even remotely associated with football knows that that can be a scary thing, Moan. And we've seen it. We've seen it end players' careers. Um, you know, without asking you to pretend to be Larry's doctor here or whatever, <laughs> uh, from what you've heard... Uh, from people who play the game for what you might have experienced yourself and how how bad is it uh, the foot is always something that you got to be careful of con- considering the fact one he is a d lineman he's not super heavy but he might be 290 300 pounders so you got to look at yourself and say but well you got to make sure he's he's rehabbing that properly. You got to make sure if he has to go slow with his recovery, he goes slow so that the bone can heal, man. Um, that was an injury that that really kind of stole. It really stole uh, the NFL about four or five years ago. It was like Liz Frank after Liz Frank. I remember that being a thing. He got to watch oh, that one summer. Shoes. That one summer. Yeah, I know. Not, yeah, it was crazy. Everybody knew about the yeah, Liz Frank. Everybody was like. It was through preseason and into the opening of the schedule. It was like there were like 30 guys. It was like, what the heck happened? Yeah, but I I think his recovery should be fine. I know this. Pittsburgh is a place that take care of guys that's dealing with any kind of injury. He is now in veteran status as far as how many years he's been in the league. He has a track record that kind of proves itself also. You know when you need him, he's going to be ready. And he has been a pro about everything, you know, that comes his way. Has he had his scuffles and stuff? Yes, he did. But I think that's beside the fact. Um, the, the point that that kind of gets this this signing for me as far as why we talked about it last week when Tua kind of you know retired, which is like you you can't just be a one way player in this league. You might have one guy that is a run stopper, right, right, but right. You better have the ability to get after the quarterback, and that's what he does in today's NFL. Running the ball is standard operating procedure. You that's part of it. But if you play D tackle. You better have a pass rush game. We spoke about Isaiah Bugs not being a guy that, you know, didn't develop his pass rushing skills. And then he ended up getting cut. And that's where a guy like Larry Ogan Joby comes into play to where he does both. I, he, he was a headache to deal with. I give him that respect right there. You know, you brought it up a couple of times just kind of in passing, but you were on the field for yeah. the, 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 the Mason Rudolph, Miles Garrett incident. And 
you know, for anyone who's not aware of this, Larry Ogunjobi was the guy who came in late and knocked Mason yeah. down uh, from behind. Now, I guess the easiest way to put this in the past uh, from the from the Pittsburgh perspective is to say, <clears throat> excuse me, there were no angels out there. No. Okay. There were no angels. Once the initial act occurred, uh, a certain number 53 from Pittsburgh got very active and, and so did a 66. And then here comes Larry from behind. So, there, you know, there, there was just there was a lot of bad badness that was going on there. Uh, Mason's not going to have any issue with this guy. No. And I'll say this. If you've been on the team, I've been on the team. We've all been around it. Um, if you're not doing that for your teammate, you're probably a bad teammate. And we, we used to review the film. Who was there? Who stayed on the sideline? Like in practice, in games, like that's the reason I ran to it because I didn't want to be looked at on film like, Mo, where were you? Yeah, where so, were you, man? What's your problem? <laughs> Do you not like me? Do you not value my friendship, Moan? Exactly. So I, I look at that situation. Larry did what any teammate was supposed to do. You better run to the pile. You better be there because if you're not, we kind of side eyed you from here on out. It's one of those who do you want in your foxhole type of questions. It's cliche as heck, but you know what it means to be a part of that group that's going to fight for their brother, right or wrong. I'll ask questions after the fact. That's that's the way it kind of rolls right there. This is a good football player. I'm going to ask it to you again here. This is what what makes him good, not just what he did against you or whatever, but what like what makes him yeah. a good player because you had to study him on film intensively I did. too. Very shifty, good side to side, has real good hips. And again, I would say not undersized, but you look at him as like I don't know if he can play and he can very well damn play football, man. He's going to go after it. He's always been available. You you look at his snap counts and his percentages that he played throughout his career. He's always been there. This one blip, yeah, he's got to get past that injury. And that's kind of what I brought up yesterday. He will be fine. He will be good in this system also as far as what Pittsburgh does. He's familiar with the opponents, and I don't think he has any shame of just doing the job, man. I have always liked him. I respected him, and he will tell you the exact same thing about me. Anytime the game was over, I found him shook his hand because that was what the respect that's really factor cool. was. And, and that's, that's what really cool. I, I respected about his play too. I found him and he did the same. You know, so I'm glad that's, that he's out of those bad awesome. places. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we come back on the Ramon Foster show, we're going to talk about the good place that he's in now and how he's going to fit in on this defensive line. Welcome back to the Ramon Foster Show. We talked about Larry Ogunjobi through the first segment. Now we're going to talk about where Larry fits in with this defensive line. Moan, is it completely set in stone that in a base 3-4 that you're going to have Cam Hayward, well, obviously, Tyson Alualu, and Larry Ogunjobi? Or could you see... Montrevious Adams rotate through there. Could you see yeah. DeMarvin Leal? Could you see Isaiah Louder Milk? Let's not yeah. forget that Chris Wormley had seven sacks, same number that Ogunjobi had last year. Yeah. Um, that's the beauty of it. Is 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 the fact that now you have options. You've also kind of given yourself some depth. Also, I could very well see Cam. I can see Montrevious. I can see Larry out there. I can see Tyson. I can see Cam. I can see Larry out there. Like that's where we are with this group. You have the ability to put Larry out there with a young guy that kind of leads him, kind of set the tone a little bit. That. This signing was huge. I think we were very excited about this defense with the idea that Tua was going to be there, too. What you also get now is a guy that has veteran experience. You get a guy that has a good pedigree. You get a guy that's been proven also in this league. I, I feel a whole lot better now, even with recovering from the foot injury, than I did when Tua retired, simply because we have a known guy. We have a guy that, again, I said this before, understands the uh, understands the division that he's playing in also. So wait, 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 you, wait, you, wait, wait, wait. Did you just say, did you just say what I think you said? Did you just say that? that you, 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 oh, I'm going to, I'm playing the, the me, rewind button call here. Me out. But did you just say that you feel as good or better about having Larry Okunjobi as you would have had to it coming back after the long layoff? 
Now, listen to me. I'm not comparing one to the other. What I am simply saying is this is to it did take a year off. OK, and, and that kind of it, it, it carries a little bit of weight too. Larry got hurt the latter part of the season. He played 16 games. OK, the fact that he has a year under his belt that he actually played, I feel a whole lot better in the aspect of he's ready to go when he gets that opportunity. The worst thing anybody can do, DK, whether it's suspension or whether it's just a quick retirement is you got to get back into the mode of playing football. Larry has been mentally locked into playing football. He is still in football playing mode. And to it, I think would have still needed some time. I think he would have still had to get back into the, the feel of being a football player. Would he have gotten back? Yes. What do I feel about one to the other? They're both solid players. But now that we know that to it mentally wasn't in it, and that's okay. A guy that's still locked in like Larry Ogan Joe. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. You, you see yeah. what I'm saying? And I'm not yeah, saying I he's do, better I do than now. That's why I wanted you to. Yeah. That's, that's why. That's why I wanted you to clarify oh, yeah. it because I had a feeling that's what you meant. And this is a lot of this that we talk now about to it. We can do so with the benefit of hindsight. Yes. Because, like you just said, we now know what his decision ultimately was. So now yes. we can say, okay, he wasn't going to be you know, all the way there. Maybe he could have ramped up or whatever, but Ogan Joby mm-hmm. was just playing for a team that went to the Super Bowl. Uh, he, that's about I, as locked in as you get, you know? Yes, 100%, man. And again, he's developed his pass rush better than he ever has before. Seven sacks last year, and I got to give it to Cincinnati. Their front defense was pretty good. And what does he bring himself over to in Pittsburgh? TJ, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? High Smith, Cam. Tyson even has a really good pass rush, too. And again, the young guys that are in the defensive line group, too, are still good. Adams, they like warm. They like they still have that aspect. So he's amongst the same supporting cast. And if any D tackle DK can give me seven plus sacks on a year, I'll take it. It's not expected yeah. from a DT, a D tackle. Now, it, it's funny, especially when you have TJ on, on the team, like every oh. sack that you get from somebody else feels like a bonus, you know? <laughs> this team and, and, and is still going to have a lot of sacks. That's where Larry Ogunjobi thrived. I was my most nervous when I had one-on-ones with him, and I knew I had no help from the left or no help from the right because he was just that shifty to where if he didn't get a sack, he was at least getting some pressure. And I'm excited about that for this defense. It gives you a lot with this sign. That's really good stuff. When we come back, hey, Moan. Welcome back to the Hump Day edition of the Ramon Foster Show. It's been a real behind-the-scenes struggle here today. Uh, things that you don't get to see. Uh, it is time for the only segment that matters, and that would be the Hey, Moan segment. And for that, we're going to bring in Matt Pierce, who's a longtime subscriber to DK Pittsburgh Sports. Uh, He's here at our headquarters downtown. If you aren't, change that. Come down here and see us. We're on Fifth Avenue. Here comes Matt Pierce. Hey, Moan. Hey, what's going (laughs) on? Hey, you know, I wanted to run something by you here real quick. You know, uh, we see we just came through the draft. And there's a lot of excitement around a lot of teams and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, high pedigree, high profile guys from from big, big time colleges that did a great job in university. And, and sometimes maybe the, the production and the performance and the expectations uh, don't meet, uh, at least in the first year, what what a what a franchise is expecting. So I just I know there's no one answer to this, but I wonder if there were any common themes among why maybe some guys that are expected, especially at certain positions, uh, don't don't uh, do a great job in the beginning. It really great question. I'll say that it, it's it's sometimes it can be circumstantial. Sometimes it can fall on the individual too. And, and circumstantial. Let's just say this. Let's look at the New York Jets situation where they drafted Zach Wilson early. You expect that guy to come in ready-made, but you also got to say to yourself, well, what's surrounding him? Does he have an offensive line? Does he have receivers? Also, what is his coaching staff like? You know, you speak about expectation. The guy that I always kind of like to bring up is uh, Jadavian Clowney. You know, he's been a guy that didn't stick with his original franchise, and he hasn't been the all-pro, all-world guy that we saw coming out to be number one overall draft pick. With that being said, 
as far as his expectations and what he's done, I can't call him a bust. What I can say is the expectations that we put on him as fans, consumers of the game, and even as a former player, I'll say I, I probably expected more. But here he is, I think, going into year nine or ten at this point, and he's had a very productive year. Cleveland just re-signed him back again not too long ago. Um, so to say it's been a bad career, no. I'll say the expectations of being number one overall, a Mario Williams type, you know what I'm saying? I don't think he's met that essentially. So let's let's look at a, a, at another guy as far as meeting those expectations and what it kind of makes because I always say this, you kind of get out what you put in. The guy that I always like to use is Ryan Shazier. From day one, he walked into practice with a very competitive edge. He thought those things. The way he practiced was a little bit different than everybody else that was a young guy. He used to come into the building during the season, fully dressed, with a satchel on his shoulder, going in there. He would get fully dressed just to get undressed and still or issue stuff just to go to the back of the locker room and watch film. That was his mentality. He wanted to be good at it. He wanted to be great at it. And to be fair to a lot of guys, too, I will say this. I think you put guys in bad situations with the way you draft them. You expect the guy to go into a building and be a day one starter without knowing his full background. I always look at Georgia, the amount of players they put into the draft this year itself. I think they either tied the record or set the record. A lot of people are attracted to those players because they won. They had one of the best historically defenses we've seen in college football. With that being said, a guy like Jordan Davis, I think it's going to be fine regardless. But the number one overall draft pick that went to Jacksonville, you got to say to yourself, did he have a great career because of Jordan Davis and his linebackers in the secondary behind him? Or is he truly that guy? Now, I, I feel like they drafted him based off potential and what he could potentially do. He has the pedigree it looked like. He has the potential to be good, and he made some plays in college. But he also went to Jacksonville. You know, they're, they're playing in a division where it's mostly run. So will he actually be able to get to the quarterback the way you need him to? Or is he just going to be a very solid run stopper? So it's a lot of those things that got to be – looked at and I know on our side we there's no forgiveness when it comes down to what production looked like either you got the numbers or you didn't um but I can't necessarily say there's one answer to it it could be coaches it could be I had a friend of mine that was drafted first round okay and two years later they drafted Von Miller what are you supposed to do about that situation this guy as coach Tomlin called him is a walking gold jacket as Von Miller. And he even admitted to me recently, he said, you know what? When they drafted Von, I probably knew my time was up. And this was from a first round draft pick. He was like, the day I saw him, that let me know that that guy is a little bit better than I am. And not in those direct words, but it kind of just lets you know it was probably time for him to move on because at that point, they already switched coaching staffs. They already had a different defensive coordinator. And he was at a point in his career was just like, well, it's probably best for me to leave because I'm not their guy. So, it's probably 10 different real answers to that. The one that's most unforgivable to me is when a young pro doesn't take the NFL series. And I think you and myself can still, we can see those guys pop up onto the scene and I have zero forgiveness for that. All right. Thank you, Moan. Appreciate it. No problem, man. That was a really good question. You made me think on that one. You know, Moan, that like half of everybody who walks in here says, Where's Ramon? <laughs> like, where's Ramon? On the computer. It's like, yeah, man, hey, he's in Nashville. He's he in was Nashville. Good, man. Yeah. But I'm here and I'm tuned in and I love these questions. All right. Well, let's let's uh let's do it again tomorrow. I'm here if you are DK. 